on 31st December 1997, Olivia Hope and her sister Amelia left their parents' Groovetown Marlboro home to attend a New Year's party in Ferno Lodge in Endeavour Inlet. After reaching Fata Mango Bay in Queen Charlotte Sound, they chartered a yacht, the Tamarack, along with a few friends. In the afternoon, after reaching Endeavour Inlet, Olivia, her sister and friends water taxied from the Tamarack to Ferno Lodge to take part in the New Year's Eve celebrations. There were about 1,500 people at the party, along with a longtime friend of Olivia, Ben Smart. After celebrating New Year's Eve at the Ferno Lodge, Ben and Olivia returned to the Tamarack on 1st January 1998. They had intended to stay the night on the Tamarack, but on arriving, they discovered 12 people already occupying all the berths on the Tamarack. Ben and Olivia then decided to go back to the shore and find somewhere else to sleep. Olivia collected her backpack, sleeping bag and other personal belongings, and between 4 a.m. and 5 a.m., they hopped on board the water taxi driven by Guy Wallace. After they set off, another passenger on Wallace's taxi offered Olivia and Ben a place to stay on his yacht, and they accepted. Wallace dropped Olivia, Ben and the mystery man off at a 12-meter wooden two-masted catch painted white with a blue stripe and round portholes. It was one of over 160 vessels moored in the area at the time, and by the morning, the boat was gone. Olivia and Ben were never seen again. When they didn't arrive home, their parents reported them missing. Their disappearance led to one of the biggest police investigations in New Zealand history. On 12th January 1998, police seized a yacht similar to the one they believed had been boarded by Olivia and Ben. It was forensically examined and the owner, Scott Watson, was thoroughly questioned. He said he had been at the New Year's celebrations at the lodge, but denied seeing Olivia or Ben there. However, police were convinced that Scott was the mystery man, even though there was no evidence against him. While Watson did have a police record from his teenage years, he hadn't had a brush with the law in a long time. The police showed Wallace, the water taxi driver, Scott's photo at least three times. Each time he said that Scott was not the mystery man. The police then showed Wallace a photo of Watson with his eyes half-closed in a montage of eight photos. Wallace said the photo did resemble the mystery man, but he had a longer hair and an unkept appearance. Wallace was also adamant that Ben, Olivia and the mystery man had boarded a two-masted catch. Yet, Watson's boat was a single-masted sloop. Another potential witness also pointed out the hooded eye photo but insisted the man had a longer hair. By May, the investigation became a murder investigation, even though no bodies had been found. Despite a number of unresolved inconsistencies between the testimony of key witnesses and the appearance of both himself and his yacht, Scott Watson was charged with the murder a month later. The only evidence police had was the hooded eye photo and two hairs found on a blanket on Watson's boat, which matched Olivia's DNA. Defense lawyers casted doubt on the evidence, as the two blonde hairs had only been discovered on a second search of the yacht. They claimed they could have been a mix-up at the lab, or they could have somehow gotten onto Watson's clothing at the party. Even though police had circumstantial evidence, the jury eventually found Scott Watson guilty of both counts of murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 17 years before he could be considered for parole. He remains behind bars today and continues to protest his innocence. Over the years, people have questioned and wondered whether the wrong man is behind bars. No one really knows what happened to Ben and Olivia on that New Year's night and they remain missing to this day. Fifteen-year-old Katrine Conard lived with her family in Gross Kadau, near Klenz in Dannenberg. On January 1, 2001, she visited her boyfriend, Joachim, 
in Baron under Doma, which was about 15 kilometers from her home. Her boyfriend was 30 years old and she had kept this a secret from her parents. Catherine and Joachim spent the afternoon together. In the evening, around 6 p.m., they both had an argument and Catherine wanted to go home, but it was getting dark and had started to snow. She texted a few friends but couldn't find anyone who was willing to drive her home. She then went to the bus stop Neustrasse on foot. But since no buses were running on that evening, she decided to hitchhike. Around this time, she sent a text message to her sister Nadine that she would arrive home by 8.30 p.m. But she never made it home. When she didn't arrive home, her parents reported her missing. An extensive search was carried out including thousands of volunteers and sniffer dogs, but to no avail. Later, a witness came forward and told police that on that night, while driving, she had seen Catherine talking to a man in dark BMW which had stopped at the bus stop, but she drove away and did not see if Catherine got into the car. This would be the last confirmed sighting of Catherine. The BMW had a Berlin license plate. However, despite years of investigation and searches, the car and the man has never been found. Police don't exactly consider him a suspect, but they would like to question him. Five years later, in October 2006, Catherine's sister got a mysterious phone call from an unknown woman with a Polish or a Russian accent who claimed to call because of her sister and only said BMW Black Hamburg. The police traced the phone call to a telephone booth in Nuremberg. In 2007, a graffiti was found on the wall of the bus stop where Catherine was last seen. The police did not publish the full text of the message and only Catherine Conard was can be read in the police photo. Then, in 2018, another phone call was made to a police station in Celle claiming to know where the body of Catherine Conard was buried, but he hung up quickly after that. The police don't know who the caller was or where it was made from or if it was a prank. There have been no suspects in the case and Catherine remains missing for 18 years. Cheryl Shepard, 29, was last seen publicly accepting a marriage proposal from her boyfriend while being broadcast on a 1997 New Year's Eve radio simulcast occurring on a local public access television channel out of Hamilton, Ontario. Her then boyfriend, Michael Lavoy, 26, said on air, In 1998, I'd like to ask you to marry me, Cheryl. Cheryl replied simply, Yes, and hugged and kissed him. In 1998, I'd like to ask you to marry me, Cheryl. Friends and family expressed astonishment at her acceptance of the proposal, as her relationship with Michael was not very healthy. Her family did not approve of him having three kids from a previous volatile relationship, nor did they approve of his precarious financial situation and frequent unemployment. Months prior, Michael had moved in with Cheryl and her mother and had been living with them off and on. Many friends report that the two-year relationship was riddled with fighting and strife. Although Cheryl was last seen on New Year's, her mother, Odette Fisher, says she spoke with her over the phone on New Year's Day and made plans for Cheryl to pick her up from the Toronto Pearson International Airport on January 4th. Strangely enough, on that January 1st phone call, Cheryl did not mention the proposal to her mother, even though they were very close. Her mother had to find out about the engagement from Michael after her daughter went missing. This led some to believe that Cheryl was not actually serious about the potential marriage and had said yes to the on-air proposal out of public pressure and or intoxication. Friends close to the couple told police that the day after the proposal, Cheryl told them she was going to call off the engagement and that she would tell Michael in a public place because she feared he would turn violent. Her fiancé, Michael, claims he last saw Cheryl on January 2nd 
when he dropped her off at a strip club called the Concord Hotel on Lundy's Lane in Niagara Falls. Supposedly, according to Michael, Cheryl was working there as an exotic dancer. However, the manager of that establishment, who had worked there for 20 years, denied this claim and said that not only did Cheryl not work for them, but he had never heard of her until police showed up asking questions. Friends say that while she had worked as a dancer in the past, those days were behind her and they were not aware of her still working in the industry, and if she had gone back to dancing, she would have told them. Cheryl worked full-time as a donut decorator at the coffee and donut shop Tim Hortons, and co-workers of Cheryl's say Michael would often show up at the fast food restaurant for long periods of time. He would hang around and make patrons and employees alike very uncomfortable. He was so jealous and possessive that when he felt Cheryl was conversing with the customer for too long, he would clear his throat and gesture for her to wrap it up. Gerald Davidson, a neighbor of the couple and part of a larger group that included both of Cheryl's previous husbands, recalls a terrifying moment in their apartment's underground parking lot when Michael lost his temper and grabbed Cheryl by the throat, a common occurrence according to people close to the couple. Clutching her throat, he yelled, If you keep f***ing around with me, something's going to happen to you. This statement was in line with family members' recollection of Cheryl, telling them that if something were to ever happen to her, they knew who to question, Michael. Another family member remembers Cheryl saying that there was a chance she could go missing in the future. The anger and jealousy exhibited by Michael was not uncommon and was a feature of his previous relationships as well. His former long-term girlfriend, Gwen, whom he dated from his teens into his mid-twenties and with whom he had three kids, recalls his fierce temper and predilection for violence. Once, he broke both her cheekbones from beating her, and often he would tell her that he had fantasies of murdering her. After a particularly nasty fight, which marked the end of Gwen's and Michael's relationship, Michael left their shared home and went to a gas station where he claimed to have just murdered his wife and kids. The gas station attendant, understandably alarmed, called police, who immediately went to check on Gwen and the kids, who were thankfully found alive. Michael was charged with public mischief, but those charges were later dropped and he faced no consequences. When Cheryl never arrived at the Toronto airport to pick up her mother, Odette, she was reported missing to police. Michael never reported her missing, even though supposedly he had not seen her since January 2nd. In the previous two days, when friends had called asking for her, he would alternately claim she was either sleeping or at work. Later, upon police questioning, he would change his story about who was to have picked Cheryl up from the strip club he had supposedly dropped her off at on January 2nd, saying that a friend was going to pick her up and then later claiming Cheryl's ex-husband, Brian Sweeney, was the one who was tasked with picking her up. Friends of the couple commented on how unusual that situation would be. Here was a man who was so jealous and possessive, he would hang out around a donut shop for hours, keeping an eye on Cheryl. But, at that same time, he was claiming he dropped her in an alleyway of a strip club in order for her to dance for other men, and then allowed her ex-husband to pick her up? That was not the controlling Michael they knew at all. Her ex-husband, Brian Sweeney, quickly came forward to the police and not only denied picking her up that night, but also requested a polygraph test to clear him of any connection to her being missing. To add to the list of suspicious behavior, Michael, upon finding out Cheryl's mother had reported her missing, removed a large majority of his clothes and possessions from their shared house. Adding to the mounting evidence against Michael, the maintenance supervisor for the building they lived in recalls seeing Michael lugging out two large garbage bags from the apartment complex. Gerald Davidson, the neighbor who had seen Michael grab Cheryl by the neck, also recalled those suspiciously large garbage bags being carried out by Michael. Police searched the garbage transfer station, but found nothing of value. The physical evidence found was limited but damning. After a 10-day investigation of the couple's apartment, 
police came away with some clues that indicated the apartment was in fact a crime scene. The first clue was that Cheryl's purse and ID were on the premises, two things she would not have left without. The second clue was both her contacts and glasses were also in the apartment. Cheryl had extremely poor eyesight and would not have gone anywhere without one of those objects on her person. The third clue was that there were some stains on the wall that police felt were suspicious, although crime scene technicians were unable to determine if it was blood or some other substance. The fourth clue was the curtains, which Cheryl's mother specifically remembers as being attached to the wall with metal curtain rods. When police investigated, they found they were nailed to the wall, indicating that the curtain rods might have been used as an improvised weapon. When police located and called Michael to come in for questioning, he had been staying at his mother's house, he promised he would come by the station the next day. However, when he didn't show up, they went looking for him. Earlier that day, a police officer, Officer Matthews, noted a suspicious-looking vehicle parked by a storage unit. He ran the plates and it came back to a Michael Lavoie. Later that day, when Officer Matthews heard that Michael was being sought for questioning, the name rang a bell and he directed police to that same storage unit he had been near earlier. In the early morning of January 5th, at 1.30 a.m., Michael was found in a rented storage garage, closed, with his car running. He was overcome with carbon monoxide poisoning and was slowly suffocating to death. Police report that he had tried to commit suicide but was found before succumbing to the carbon monoxide and taken to the hospital. Michael admitted nothing during questioning and directed police to speak with his lawyer. Later, police would learn that Michael had mailed a suicide note to his mother, Pat Lavoie, prior to entering the storage unit. This demonstrates that he was serious about the attempt and intended to die that day had police not intervened. But what was he so guilty about? What made him that depressed? If his story was to be believed, which many do not, he wasn't even aware she was missing for more than 24 hours. So why the histrionics? What does he know that police and Cheryl's family do not? Michael declined to take part in any of the numerous on-air interviews or public pleas for Cheryl's safe return. He has also refused to help in any of the outdoor searches for remains or clues. There is a persistent rumor circulating around Hamilton that the reason Cheryl's remains will never be found is that Michael put her through a wood chipper. No one has been arrested in connection to her disappearance and police are actively investigating. There is a $50,000 reward for information on Cheryl's whereabouts or that of her remains or information leading to the arrest of her attacker. Anyone with any knowledge of her fate should contact Detective Peter Tom at 905-546-3843.